But good evening. Um, we are here again um, to just worship uh, through songs and through the word. And so I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Second Samuel uh, chapter 11. Uh, we'll be looking at, um, is, we'll be going through a series here that's to do with dealing with sin, uh, dealing with sin. That will be the series, and we will look at that series. We'll have two Sundays, uh, um, the Sunday and the following one. And the idea there is we all have uh, this experience of dealing with sin. What do we do when we have sinned? And uh, there are many ways how we deal with sin. But I want to highlight two that I hope by the end of the series or tonight we'll begin to process and look at sin differently. Actually, this is a series of the theology of sin. And so, what are the two ways of how man or we normally deal with sin? First is we cover, conceal. We sin, and the next thing, the response that how we handle it, we want to cover. We don't want to be exposed. And the second way we deal with sin is we confess. So those are the two. And this night we're going to look at the first one that is dealing with concealing. And how we're going to approach this is I'm going to uh, present to you uh, two illustrations uh, that shows what is accomplished with each uh, one of those I've just mentioned. And tonight we're going to start with uh, this uh, approach of concealing sin. When we sin, we want to cover it. And what do you accomplish? And how does it work like? And I think our chapter that we're going to be looking tonight will show us how that works. How does this strategy of concealing sin work? And what is it that it achieves? Second Samuel chapter 11 uh, comes after we have seen so many success, um, so many sort of growth and marvelous work. And it, when you look at uh, David's title, uh, Man After God's Own Heart, so far it's been fitting pretty well with him. He's been a man of God. He's been a pious man. He's loved God. He's followed the, the laws. He's, he's, he's a man who wants to do things according to the way God wants him to do. Followed every bit of it. And it's just that the climax of a spiritual stature. A man after God's own heart. But then the writer decides to sneak in right here, this chapter. Uh, and this chapter is quite grim. Uh, this chapter is quite disturbing. Because what's going to happen in this chapter is not what we think of David. And you wonder, why? And how does that work like that? But mostly we should see him how he will deal with sin. That's part of the big thing that we see here. So first, and we're going to be reading as we go through the text. We're just going to be walking through the text and just observe, make some observations. First, we see uh, verses 1 through 5, uh, what it does there, what we see is that that section exposes how temptation leads to sin. First, first it says, In the spring of the year, uh, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servant with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. 
It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, probably his servant, one of his servants, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messenger and took her, and she came to him and lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So here we are. We're talking about, first he start, the, the, the author tells us, on the spring of the year, uh, at the time when kings go to war, basically this is the season right after the rains, because during the rain it's just so hard to fight, because you use horses, you use wagon, chariots, and all that, and traveling is not easy. But now springs come, it comes with dryness. Now the land is easily accessible, you can get to the enemy, and fight battle. So it's just the right time to go to battle, to fight battle. And the kings, guess what? They go with the group, always. And I think David has done this for several battles. He's demonstrated his leadership. He goes with the uh, army, uh, his military, to fight the battle. So that was the normal standard, that the king goes with the people, uh, his servants, to fight to the war. But in this case, we see that um, David, at this point, he's not going to battle. He's going to stay behind. Um, at the end of the verse there, of verse 1, it says, But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, whatever is going to happen here, more normally it's attributed to him uh, because of you know, staying back home. And so he, st he was supposed to go, and now look what happened. But the reality is, this is not going to be the first time David stays home when they have to go to war. He did that in chapter 10, verse 7. He sent Job to go to fight. And uh, Job and his brother, Abishai, they were out there fighting. He stayed home. And then we'll see also, like in chapter... 21 verse 17, David's man pleads with them, age with them to stay home. Do not go out to fight again because they saw that it was risky. So staying back home, and it's probably believed or suggested that even this event when they pleaded him, urged him to stay home, happened prior to this, what we're going to see and kind of we're going to see tonight. So it wasn't a new thing for him to stay home when he was supposed to. But this was uncharacteristics of David because David was a man of war. He wants to fight. But nevertheless, he stays home. So the writer here, or the author, is just trying to explain to us, this is, was the tradition, the custom of what would happen, that people go to war, kings go with them, but at this point, David stays home. And so that's basically what happens. Now he stays home, what's happening with him? And he's taking a nap, which was normal. You, you know, you, you, you feel tired at some point, and so he sleeps. Uh, sleeping on his couch, on his bed, basically. And then when he got up from his sleep, from his nap, he decides to walk. And, and the word there by walking it's not just walking from one place to there. No, uh, the idea is he's walking around. He's just, you know, and, and it was kind of like I said, it, it, it's hot, and, and at that time of the day, you have cool breeze coming, and, it, and if you're a king, obviously you have a best spot, and the roof is just a nice place to be to get that fresh air. And so he's out there getting that fresh air, and he's just walking around. And the next thing, what we see there, is that he sees a woman bathing. Why he's up there walking? Because obviously, you know, his, his policies look on top. You can see what's happening underneath there. 
He sees the woman bathing. Well, what's interesting that after he sees the woman bathing, it doesn't stop there. He continues to pursue. And this is where you see James chapter 1 comes in, into play. I will just read it ahead of so you have it in mind. It says, but each person is tempted. It basically start with God does not tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So you have luring, you have enticement, and then you have desire. And here what you're going to see is the snare of temptation. What's the snare of this temptation? And it starts with the desire. Desire becomes the snare of that temptation because he sees it, a woman bathing. And then also, you know, we, uh, this goes along with the song that the singer I was blind by my sin. And that's basically what's going to be happening here. So we're looking at how temptation leads to sin here. But it starts from far. So he sees, and then he doesn't stop so as to the, and I move on. No, he, he keeps walking around. And it's playing in his mind. And the desire continues to grow. The next thing, he goes to step number two. And so he inquires about the woman. And it's kind of interesting that when you are in the moment of being lured by temptation, God becomes so gracious to give you something that can slow you or stop you. But if you are so into your desire, those uh, uh, helps, they just don't, you know, work out at that point. And that's what we see with him. So he goes and inquires, and he's the thing, one of the servants tell him, He's like, who is this lady? Come on, it's not your business. Why do you have to know this, be this woman? You don't know her, and you don't just forget it. No, I want to know who she is. And so the servant tells him, oh, that, that, that's, that's a wife. That's a wife of somebody. So that should have signaled right there. Wow, if I go further, that's an adultery. But he's not thinking at this point, because the desire is just becoming powerful. And so, continues to inquire, this is, you know, the wife of somebody, and not just some random, ordinary person. No. This is the daughter of um, Iliam. Iliam was one of the variant men, 30 variant men of David. And so he's what? He's the daughter of one of you, a variant man that you have, of those 30s. You, you, uh, I forgot where you can find them, but they're there. He's one of the 30 variant men. Well, so that should be, oh, all right, okay, I know, this is a variant man, forget about it. No, but uh, this servant wants to make the point. He's not just a variant man, but he's, this woman is a wife of another variant man who's right now currently fighting a battle for you out there. So you'd think that should be enough to keep David so okay, forget it. Let me move on. No. Nope. Continues to choir. <clears throat> the desire continues to be stronger that the word that comes to him does not even ring the bell in his mind. So it proceeds. And the next thing he sent, knowing that this woman is married, he continues to pursue her. And the desire, what does it do? It gives birth to sin. It says the verse, uh, chapter James 1, 14, 15. It says, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin. That desire when it grows and grows, you nature it. Because that's basically what's happening at that time. You're naturing it. And there's nothing to stop you. If the word cannot stop you, nothing is going to stop you. So, guess what? It leads to sin. 
So this is how temptation leads to sin. It starts with desire. What is, what, what, what's, what's the snare? What is it that snares into temptation? It's the desire. We have good desire, but they can be desire that will lead you to sin. And this is what's happening with David here. So guess what is happening with him? His desire took him and he sends him, leads him to sin. And it's kind of fascinating. So as you see David sent messenger and took her and she lays, he lays with her. And surprise, I am pregnant. Now there's something there that the author puts there that it's very important. And that is, it's in the parenthesis in your Bible. Now, she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Ladies, you know what that means. There was no way to have no any father of this child other than David. Because, first of all, the husband is at war. And she's just gone through period. The next man she's meeting is David. David is the father of this child. So this conception goes to David no matter what. And I think the author tries to help us how this works. But either way, what we see there, it starts with the desire and it ends up escalate into sin. Well, Sin has committed. David has sinned. And he has sinned against who? God. Because God is the one who essentially put this law. You shall not commit adultery. But David has sinned. Well, what do I do? Well, he realizes he has seen he's done something wrong. What do I do? I am the king. I know what's the consequences of sins. I'm the leader. What do I do next? What's the solution? So we see verse 6 through 25. We see David's solution to the sin that he has committed. Now, the solution is easy and straightforward. For him, at least. And that's what? Cover it up. Conceal. Conceal it. Let nobody know this. Okay, obviously we know. But uh, Bathsheba knows it. Uh, and, and the servant that he sent out there might have an idea too. But that's it. Let's, let's cup it in. Conceal it. And so here's the process of concealing. But in so doing, we see there's a progression to something worse. That's what's going to happen here. So, he will try to accomplish his concealing by matter. That's where it's going to go. But first you see there in verse 6 through 13. Let's see. So David sent word to Job, send me Uriah and uh, the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Job was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the, uh, the king's house and there followed uh, him a present from the king. You know, he's, he's the, the present that comes with you. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his uh, uh, his lord, and did not go down to his, wa uh, to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of the Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as you live, as your soul lives? 
I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here to, uh, today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in the presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his wife. So you see what's happening here. David knows something is wrong here. I have sinned. The, the way to deal with this, I'm just going to cover it up. Well, uh, what, what do I do? I need to bring Uriah come here to the house so that Uriah sleeps with his wife, and in that way things are cleared up. We, we, we sweep it around under the rug. That was the plan. But it's just like one of those things that God will make it harder for David. Because he, he, he's now, you see what sin does. Because you're trying to cover it, now you're going to affect somebody else. So the point is trying to make Uriah sin. He, he got to participate in this sin. So he brings Uriah out here, and then he tries to lure him. He's already been lured in the sin. Now he's going to be the agent of luring, of attracting, uh, uh, enticing Uriah to his sin. But Uriah is a man of God right now. It's, it's a kind of a humbling situation here. Uriah, who is like a junior now, he's becoming the spiritual giant, and David now has become an inferior spiritually. So Uriah comes back, he understands his rules, he understands what God expects of him. I must be in the battle. I don't know why I've been uh, brought back here. And the king tells him, okay, uh, you know what? Uh, we give you an excuse. You, you, you go home and, and, and you know, drink and just, just, just get some rest. Well, there's something behind it. He wants Uriah to cover him by sinning. But Uriah loves the Lord, and Uriah is committed to doing what is expected of him. Not from the king, but from God. And so, you, you, you can imagine how that was becoming more challenging for David, because at this point, he realizes the plan is not working according. Because it was well calculated, Uriah comes, he goes to his house, and then blah, 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 and then, and then that's it. We're done. Nope, that's not how it's going. Uriah understands his place. I must be in the battle. And if you bring, back, you bring me back here, guess what? I'm not going to the house, and I'm not going to sleep with well her. <laughs> that was the whole point of bringing you back here. And so that fails. Well, that progresses to, so plan one doesn't work, plan two. What's plan two? Well, we see that in verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Job and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And in the letter he wrote, this is what was written in the letter, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. Now, here's the thing. If you know the theology of sin, guess what? The consequences of sin is death. When sin has been committed, somebody must die. So for David, understand, I'm not going to be the person to die. Uriah has to die because sin has to be covered. My sin has to be covered. So that's the step number two that he's going to take. That's the second approach he's going to do. So it was... now. This had happened before to him. Remember when Saul was chasing David? What was the first approach he did? He did the same approach. Put David in the front where it's more fearsome, where, 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 where he can face like the strongest army so he can die. That happened to David. Guess what? David is applying the same idea to this man here. Now, actually, David goes worse. 
because for so it was like just put him on the front so I, you know so I, I, at least he dies while he's fighting but David doesn't do that what he does he says I can put him in a place in a very um, risky dangerous place and guess what he should do withdraw the point is he must die and this is the man after God's own heart as we know him and look what he's devising right now. And look at how far the sin has taken him, how deep he's gone into the sin. He's just entangled himself into it. And he can't see at this way. Sin has blinded him right now. So he's into it. But it's all at what? Trying to cover the sin. That's the goal. We must cover the sin at whatever step. And so, we see there in verse 16, and as Job was besieging the city, so Job uh, receives uh, this, um, this letter, instruction, and so as Job was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were variant men. Men means strongest men. You know, like wherever he knew that because you know, everybody, when you're fighting with your enemies, you will figure out where, is, where, where they're keeping their strong guys. You know that. And Job was a very good militant. He, was, he, he laid so many battles. So he knew he could start at the war. He could realize, okay, that's where it is. You remember what he did? Uh, I think it was in chapter 10 uh, when he was, he was sent out to battle, him and Abichai, and he tells his brother, you know what? He, he came up with strategy. You know, you go this way, I go this way. If they, if I, I'm having issues here, I'll, you come help me. And if you're having, a, so he was a very st good strategist. And I don't know if he knew what was going on, but he knew something was out, because all he's heard, number one, uh, please send Uriah. And he's like, okay, number one, Uriah is not supposed to go back home. Maybe something has happened. But then he gets this letter. Uriah must, be, must die. And Job just listened to that. So we see here, so Uriah, Job makes his strategy to accomplish what David wants to do, so he puts Uriah in front of, I guess, this variant man. And verse 17, And the man of the city came out and fought with Job, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. And then Uriah the Hittite also died. So David's wish was given. Mission accomplished. Then Job sent and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, when you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then, if the king anger rises, and if he says to you, "Why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know? Um, did you not know that they were uh, they would they would shoot you from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of uh, Jerubbaal? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Tebes?" Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah, the Hittite, is dead. So, Joel prepares himself. He doesn't really have an idea of what's happening with there, but all he's realizing is that if David knows, understand that we've been defeated, and, and this was poor strategy. That, that was a strategy that was set to fail. If you want to lose, this is because what the, they had already uh, conquered these people, and all they needed to do is just to sit still, to just, just give that siege to them. But you don't go close to their wall. That's very disadvantageous. You don't do that. You wait far. And so he realizes that was the instruction given to him, and he applies that, and this catastrophe that has happened here, he's lost his man, his variant man, because of this uh, kind of silly sort of strategy that has been applied here. Now he looks 
And now he prepares himself because he doesn't know if, if the king will be happy with this. So he's telling his messengers, okay, um, tell him this is what happened. And if he gets angry, just tell him, Uriah is also dead. That's basically the trick. Tell him the Uriah, the, as you sent me the letter, Uriah is dead. But you'll be shocked by the response. It, it was not a response probably uh, Joab was expecting. Because there you see in verse 22, so the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger uh, said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. You don't do that. You, you chase them, but you stay away. You keep them so that they don't go out. That's the siege. But you don't go close to them because they always have these archers that are ready to just loosen it and you're dead. And so, but he's explaining to, the, to, to, to David there, and we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah and the, Hitt, uh, the Hittite is dead also. Well, David was not angry. I think there was some sort of joy in his heart. There was, why, why would he be angry? The man or the purpose of the strategy was accomplished. He wanted Uriah to die. He didn't care about the other things. So David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Job, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours one, uh, now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against uh, the city and overthrow it and encourage him. Encourage Job. It's okay. <laughs> I was not David. But right now it's okay. It's okay. He plays it down. He makes it very significant. And in his heart, he feels mission accomplished. It's covered. Now I can rest. But he wasn't fully done. Look at the next thing. Because he, he wants to cover it. Now, now he's tried to cover it with matter, but it's not enough. He has to completely wrap it up. And he's going to cover using marriage. He's going to do it with marriage. So you see in verse 26, 27. When the, the wife of Uriah heard that uh, Uriah, her husband, was dead. And look, look, look at the, the author, how he writes it. He doesn't say Bathsheba. He wants to help us see what has happened here. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, has dead, she lamented over her husband. This woman had her husband, and David had committed adultery with this woman. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. So here's how we're going to clean up this thing is we're going to, I'm going to just bring the woman into the home. It's done there. It's clean. You know, it's like, okay, um, people don't know about this pregnant. They'll just feel like, you know, we are married now. So it's just clear. But it's going to go deeper than that. But here's something the words that are very resonating here. The last word. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And actually, uh, to say displeased there, it's, it's to just lighten up. The, the word that is used there is evil. 
the thing that David had done was evil. And I think if you read as we, we go through it, you know, you can't describe it any other way but evil. He is the man after God's own heart. He commits this evil. He commits adultery. It leads him to commit murder. And technically, there's three sins that he committed because he knew. He was a man who knew he was a king. King knew what, you know, the commandments that was given. That was one thing you write down. And I think David was one of the kings that was really good, excellent in understanding what was required of him from God. And that's why when you look at chapter 7, he is helping his son, or he's, he's going to prepare his son, uh, especially in the kings, I guess. He, he's going to prepare his son to follow God, to follow God's word carefully. And so he understands what is expected of him. Right now, he has committed three sins. He has committed sin against adultery. He has committed murder. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. That's where we are. And look at what it takes him to just cover that sin. There's so much effort put into it. Now, I think here you see that David has been humbled. David is fighting with the reality. And at this point, it feels to him as if things have been done according to the plan. His clean things have been swept under the rug. But the reality is everything that has just happened here, it's open before the Lord. Now, some things to just learn here through this story. First of all, is you see that concealing sin leads to more wickedness. When you want to cover sin, you have to commit another sin. And that's just exactly what we see illustrated. And covering sin is not the first time we see David doing here. Covering sin goes first with Adam and Eve. When they sin, what do they do? They came up open to God? No, they hide. They were hiding themselves. So that's not new. But what did they achieve? Well, God still found them. God still found them. Because what you see when you're trying to cover achieve, you think you are achieving security. Like for David, it was like a self. It was like, oh, I'm self now. We're, we're self. But it was false security. The next thing we see here is we learn here is that your sin is committed before God who knows every secret. And that's one of the things that, you know, when you're covering sin, at that point, you forget God. That's basically what it is. You forget who God is. And that's, David, as much as he's um, uh, embedded in his heart with, his, his, uh, with the words and all that, God is out there. He's just thinking of himself and man. I don't want them to know what has just happened here. He's not thinking about God. And that's basically... Forgetting that God knows uh, everything. Look at, this is what you see his son later on in Kings. But I think it's First Kings chapter 8 when the, the, uh, the, the, the temple of God he had uh, built was finished and he was praying to God. One of the things he highlighted, he says, talks to God, says, For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind. There is nothing hidden from God. But it's not that he doesn't know. It's just like us. It's not that we don't know that God knows. We just forget. At that moment, we just forget. God is the one who puts standards. 
Because right now we are looking, I think we are looking, we may look things just like David did. He was look, I've seen, I've seen the guest Uriah, which is true. But Uriah did not put those commandments. God put those commandments. But David is busy trying to cover it from the man. And he's forgetting who really put that commandment. He's violating the very person who set that standard. You shall not commit murder. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And that's the man that he's really offended right now. When you sin, you are accountable to the holy God who is the consuming fire. He is the one who passes judgment. And so for now, what we see here is that concealing sin does not take you anywhere. Yes, from your perspective and from man, you feel like you are good. But in reality, when you stand before God, who really, like, who chose you, who saved you, who controls you, who sustains you, nothing, nothing can be covered. So it's a good lesson to think through. And as I said, it's not that we don't know, but we forget. And that's what really found David himself in a situation like that. So anyway, for tonight, it was just saying, what does covering sin achieve? And how does it work? We've seen how it works, and we see what it achieves. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the other approach. And hopefully that will be also helpful to understand what sin is not according to man, but according to God. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to go to prayers. Father, thank you for this night, and that we can look in your word and just be able to be reminded of the truth that we already know. And mostly in this time that whenever we sin, it's because we've forgotten. And we, if you look at the prophets, many, 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 several times, they will speak to Israel that they have forgotten God and that led to sin. Help us to remember who you are and that way it will help us to have the right approach, a biblical approach to dealing with sin. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.